our hymn books and turn to hymn number 126 to begin with. 126, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, I myself and thee. Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin a double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no anger know? These for sin could not redeem. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages, clap for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 33 for our scripture reading and commentary. Exodus chapter 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land of which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. Here we see Moses as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ leading forth the people out of Egypt, but not without the shedding of blood, the Passover lamb, with that strong hand. Here, now after all of those years, having promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, all dead already this time, yet promised that he would raise up that seed and give them that land. People like to call that land the Holy Land, but that's not what we find in Scripture, it's the promised land. And what God promises, he fulfills in his time. So this is the beginning of it. He says, I will send an angel before thee. That would be a messenger. Often when reading the scriptures, you'll find several types of Christ. He's represented in Moses, but also this angel represents the messenger of the covenant. He says, I will send an angel before thee. This represents also the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that he was a created being in any way like the other angels, but as the archangel, the prince over the angels, the messenger of the covenant, that word angel means messenger, who would cause that everything be fulfilled exactly as God purposed. So here he says, I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, and the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. These were all enemy nations that dwelt in the land at the time and that the Lord would remove in order for the seed of Abraham, the physical seed, promise should take that land. They're still fighting over that today. That's what all the conflict is about over there because on the one hand the descendants of these here, Canaanites, that still dwell there, Palestinians and others that dwell in what they call the West Bank, they still claim that that land is theirs. And yet the Lord clearly in Scripture declared that now he would put the Jewish people in that land according to the promise of Abraham for one reason. Out of that seed, Christ should come. 
It's not that that land is of any significance or importance to God today because everything's been fulfilled. The only reason he continues to preserve that land today is because he promised he would. But as long as the sun rises and the moon shines, he's, he said, I'll be faithful in preserving that physical seed. That's it. It's not because they're the favorite sons of God any more than the Palestinians or any more than any other nation. But God promised and keeps what he promised. It's a type and picture of even what God has promised us in Christ, that there's, there's no condemnation to those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I will say that that natural seed of Israel today has been left to blindness, and they're as much God-haters as anybody around them. Go over there and declare unto them, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, that there's only salvation in, through, and by his perfect work of righteousness and death. They'll spit on it. In fact, they might even have you arrested because they will not to this day have Christ to reign over them, just as in the day when Christ was on this earth. And yet God's faithful, in spite of that hatred, in spite of that denial today, he continues to preserve them in that land. And when you look on a map and see the little sliver of land and all the enemies around, you can only say it's God that's keeping that people in that land. It's like the sea. It comes to a certain part. You think about the earth and how 78 to 90 percent of the earth is, is water, and yet it comes up and then goes back. It's the Lord. So he describes it here unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Here again, it represents what we enjoy in Christ, milk and honey. Each of those being a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I will not go. But then he says, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. He's reminding them that it's not for any goodness in them that he's doing this but because of what he's promised and his faithfulness. And it says, when the people heard these evil tidings, think about people today that aren't even aware that God's presence has been removed from them, but this particular time, when they heard these tidings, that the Lord would not go up with them, being a stiff-necked people, and that he would consume them in the way we know that he did because they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. But when these heard this at this time, they mourned. That's not repentance. People can hear a word from the Lord of judgment in fear, but that's not repentance. Here this morning was more of remorse. It says no man did put on him his ornaments. In other words, all of a sudden the Music stopped, and they thought that by at least showing an outward form of repentance, that somehow that would stay the hand of God. But the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore, now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. This is human language, clearly is the Lord speaking, but it's language we can understand. That God has threatened, and he does and will accomplish what he purposed. The only thing that could stay his hand would be his own grace and mercy. So we see both of these represented here in this chapter, God's judgment, his justice. And I know if the Lord has done a work of grace in our hearts, we'll confess that we are a stiff-necked people and that should God purpose to destroy us, he would be just in doing so. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. This is where God first appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Or was a central location. This is where God would give his law. And as Hebrews describes it, the fiery mountain. That's what the word horror means. It means 
a bright and fiery mountain. It's also known as Sinai. Sinai from the wilderness of sin, S-I-N, which represented the wilderness, a dry place. But both the fiery mountain or Sinai represent God's strict justice, that he sees nothing but condemnation apart from a mediator. And that's where we get to. The children of Israel strip themselves of their ornaments. Those ornaments represent everything that man uses to try to better themselves, appear to be humble before the Lord. But none of that would be the reason why God would stay his hand. And that's why we read in verse 7, Moses took the tabernacle. What did that tabernacle represent? But the person of Christ. So again, we see these different types. God in the flesh took that tabernacle and pitched it without the camp far off from the camp, called it the tabernacle of the congregation. In other words, if any were to meet with God, it would have to be in this place, but not just running in and out. There had to be a representative, which we can see here Moses was for the people. It came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord. It's interesting that there were some that were so hardened that they didn't see the need to seek the Lord even in this even watching and hearing everything that was going on. But everyone which sought the Lord, who will seek the Lord, but those in whom he puts his spirit. They went out under the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Christ died without the camp. There in Jerusalem, separated even from that old city. We have a lot of types here. And it came to pass when Moses went out under the tabernacle that all the people rose up and notice, stood every man at his tent door. Such is the justice and holiness of God that none of them could approach. They had to stand at their door, and it says, look after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. Here again, it's a whole message, a picture of Christ. He's the tabernacle, but he's the representative of Moses. And Unless God blessed this, their representative, there would be judgment. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended. There again is a type of Christ. Christ being that, what's called the Shekinah glory. And stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. In representation. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. The key there is all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door, but it's those that saw the cloudy pillar, that seen eye that the Lord gives to cause any to see the presence of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. There's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I and the Father are one. When he came on this earth, it was him communing with his Father. As a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Moses represented the law. And that law had to be satisfied. Joshua see here would represent again the Lord Jesus Christ Joshua means Jesus and in his time the law Moses couldn't bring that people into the land but Joshua did but the law had to be satisfied and Moses said unto the Lord see thou sayest unto me bring up this people and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now the picture shifts, because Moses was a man. He was a type, an anti-type of the Lord Jesus Christ, where Moses was but flesh. Christ was God in the flesh. But nonetheless, a type. But here we see him looking to the Lord for grace. I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. That's what the Lord said to him. 
Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, I would say that word if would be better translated since I have found grace in thy sight. Show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. Again, we come back to a picture of Christ representing his people. Christ did not presume anything as the mediator. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. And our Lord Jesus communing with his Father didn't take anything for granted, as if to say, well, you're my Father, I know everything's going to be fine. No. He had to approach unto his Father, seeking his Father's will, seeking his Father's approval, and his grace as a man, every bit as much as if he were not God. So I see that here as, as Moses seeks the favor of God, first upon himself, and then for that people, consider that this nation is thy people. There had to be a perfect righteousness that God would approve, first in his son, God the Father and his son, but then for that people that he represented. And he said, my presence shall go with thee, I will give thee rest. Here again is a picture of the Lord putting his blessing on Moses, even as the Father put his blessing on the Son. To go with him through this entire, he was given the Spirit without measure, that he might accomplish as a man what was necessary for the salvation of his people, to be glorified as the Son and his people in him. All that we see in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the salvation of his people. The presence of the Father never left him all the way from the conception through to the cross and on into glory. He said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. You couldn't separate Christ and his person and the Father. The two are, are one. And to go with him is the Father going with him. And here Moses said, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. I would say we would say the same thing, that unless the Lord, his presence are with us, we don't want to move from here. We need his blessing in Christ. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated. That word separated is the word sanctified, set apart in him. I and thy people. John 17, Christ prayed that his people might be sanctified in him. I sanctify myself for them. If we were separated unto God, it was an electing grace, but it was also in that redeeming grace when Christ came and fulfilled the work. But separated from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Think about what it means to be the Lord. Separated out. Sanctified unto him in our Represented the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is God's first elect, and everybody else that God has chosen elected him. And what God does on behalf of his people, he does for Christ's sake. Otherwise, there would be no salvation. And all that we receive of him is because of Christ. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. All use this scripture over there in Romans 9 to show that if God shows mercy, it's because he's purposed to. If he's gracious, it's because he's purposed to. Not because anyone deserves it. So there is a, a remnant according to the election of grace, even today. So when I read and see how the Lord has blessed a wretched sinner such as I am in Christ, having taken my sin debt, paid it, worked out that perfect righteousness, and God the Father having imputed it there, on completion of his work at the cross. That's where the salvation was accomplished. He 
said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. This is as much for our benefit as anything. Why do we need a mediator? Why do we need one to represent us before a holy God? Because no man can see God and live, not in his flesh. And the Lord said, Behold, I love that word, Behold, pay attention. There is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. See, the types just keep flowing here. Moses represents Christ as a mediator, but the rock, we know, also represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock. A cliff was a carved out place in the rock. People say today where they find Mount Horeb, still down there in that Saudi Arabian desert, that you can see where this carved out cave would have been, even today in that mountain. He says, I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. That's really what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. When it says pass by, pass over, the condemnation didn't fall on us, but it fell on the representative. He says, I will take my hand away, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. It wasn't seen until Christ came and Revealed, was revealed in the flesh and accomplishes salvation. And now Paul says that God reveals himself in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we can ever see God and live. What a glorious picture, both of God's holiness and justice, but at the same time his mercy and grace in Christ Jesus. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. And I pray even what we've heard now, we would uh, turn up the follow ground of these hearts. It's so easy to become dry and hardened. When you're pleased to bless, you do once again sow the seed of Christ and water it. Cause it to grow by your grace so that we behold your glory in Him. Thankful for your scripture, for your word. Pray for your blessing as we continue our time of worship. Thanks and praise in our dear Savior's name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books again and turn to hymn number 282, Hiding in Thee. Oh, save to the rock that is higher than I, my soul in its conflicts and sorrows would fly, so sinful, so weary, thine, thine would I be. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee, hiding in thee, hiding Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. In the calm of the noontide, in sorrow's lone hour, in times when temptation casts o'er me its power, in the tempests of life, on its winding sea, Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in Thee, hiding in Thee, hiding in Thee. Thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. How oft in the conflict, when pressed by the foe, I have fled to my refuge and breathed out my woe. How often when 
and trials like sea billows roll. Have I hidden in thee, O thou rock of my soul? Hiding in thee, hiding in thee, thou blessed rock of ages, I'm hiding in thee. You notice the writer was William Cushing. He wrote these words. He wrote actually some 300 different hymns. But this one particularly, a man by the name of Ira Sankey, who actually was D.L. Moody's song leader, liked it and asked permission to put it into a hymn and it became part of D.L. Moody's Crusades. I in no way recommend Ira Sankey. I in no way recommend uh, D.L. Moody. They preached a free will message. And I don't know, but even William Cushing himself was of the same ilk. But it shows God's sovereignty, even as we see in Scripture. God can cause even a donkey to speak. And a number of these hymns, I know some get curious and they go back and look them up and they think, well, can we really sing this because they don't really appear to have believed the gospel we do. Well, enough is written here, I believe, that those that are the Lord's can sing it and sing it to the glory of Christ, even as the Lord has taught us. So this here was written out of the outgrowth of many heartaches and tears and conflicts and soul yearnings by William Cushing. I don't know whether the Lord ever in the end turned his heart through those or not, but here we have it today and I believe knowing how the Lord has been pleased to teach us, it is certainly a hymn that we can sing to the glory of Christ. And so coming to my text here in 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 9 through 18 see how this is parallel to what we just read in Exodus chapter 33. I've entitled this the cleft of the rock. Sometimes it's spelled C-L-I-F-T, cleft or cleft, but either way it refers to a cave, an inlet into a mountain. And that's where we find Elisha here in verse 9. Remember that for 40 days and 40 nights he had trudged from where he had been up to Horeb over a long distance and the Lord sustained him on that simple bacon cake and a cruise of water. And we're looking at types of pictures of Christ that this is what sustained Elisha. Just as we saw in Exodus 33, there are many types. It's as if you're walking down a path and you look on one side and say, oh, there's one. And as you go to the path, you look over here, like, oh, there's there's one. That's how we read the scriptures. It just, as the Lord opens our eyes, it unfolds before us. There's no one type in scripture that could ever describe the infinite glories of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why sometimes he's represented as a tree. That's why sometimes he's represented as a rock. Sometimes he's represented as a stream of water. Sometimes he's represented as a bacon cake. Sometimes he's represented as a cruise of water. But we rejoice in reading through here as the Lord opens these up. And I will tell you that here, this cave, it says, and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. That cave also is a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What Doest thou hear Elijah? It's not that the Lord needed any information because it's the Lord that was directing his path. And I believe the Lord directed Elijah even to this place that it might be for our learning. See, all of these things all wrote in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that these are given as examples for our learning. And here, again, the question is asked, not so much for Elijah's sake, or even for the Lord's sake, but 
for us to see how it is that the Lord deals with his own. And he said, in verse 10, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Can you see how even in that, what they call complaint, but more so Elijah, opening his soul unto the Lord as to what his burden was, how even that's a type and picture of the cries of our Lord and his Father. The burden that our Lord Jesus Christ, if someone were asked, what doest thou here? Christ. What are you doing in the garden of Gethsemane? Christ. What are you doing on your face before your Father? And how the Lord was brought many times to a place where he cried out unto his Father with the same burden. Think here, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. What brought the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth other than he was jealous for his Father, for his glory and honor? And uh, he would not move or go anywhere but what he had the Father's blessing. And uh, the same could be said. He came unto his own, his own received him not. For the children of Israel, this is talking about the physical, natural seed of Abraham, have forsaken thy covenant. What covenant is that all about? Well, that's the covenant of God's grace, how he promised to bless a people in the Lord Jesus Christ, and how everything in that Old Testament, the law pointed to Christ, the one who would come and fulfill it. And all the promises, Paul wrote there in 2 Corinthians, are in him, yea and amen. But they have forsaken thy covenant. Just like when Christ came, they turned the thumbs down on him. He came on his own, his own received him not. Had it not been that God had a remnant, those that he would preserve unto himself. Or even as Paul said, even to this day in Romans 11, verse 6, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any left even to acknowledge God's glory in that covenant of grace that he purposed from eternity to glorify his Son. They've thrown down thine altars. Those altars in the Old Testament represented the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they've thrown them down and slain thy prophets with the sword. All the way through the history of Israel, those that were blinded, opposed and pursued the prophets that the Lord had raised up, even down to his own son when he brought him to this world. They slew the prophets which were before him, and they cried, crucify him, crucify him. So you can see that same spirit that was in them. And I will tell you, it's the same spirit that's in any one of us. Ask yourself why it is that I'm not of that number. Well, there's only one answer. That God and his electing grace separated us out as a people, just like we read in Exodus 33. People separated out of him. And for whom the Lord Jesus Christ came and laid down his life. When they cried, crucify him, crucify him, they were accomplishing their will but at the same time, they were accomplishing the will of the Father. That's the great mystery of God's providence. And all the while, they were glad to be rid of Christ. God was putting his lamb into their hands that they might crucify him and slay him, just like they did the Passover lamb. They didn't realize it. That's what God was accomplishing. But can it be said, can it not be said in verse 10 there where Elijah said, I, even I, only am left the scriptures tell us that God looked down from heaven whether there were any that he could look to that would be righteous, that could in any way accomplish his glory. And he found none. There's none righteous, no, not one. And so the scriptures tell us that it was the strong hand of God the Father that brought salvation to his people. Else there would be no salvation. That was in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to the earth to accomplish that salvation on behalf of 
people that God purposed to save. And so I see even in that, I, even I only am left. Of all of mankind, there's only but one that would fulfill and accomplish the will of God the Father, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. But even there, it could be said, as of Christ, they seek my life to take it from them, take it away. Blinded, when Christ came to this earth, they were daily pursuing his life, just like here with Elijah. That's where the Lord said unto him, verse 11, he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Stand upon the mount. This is Mount Horeb that is mentioned several times throughout the history of Israel. All the way back when God first appeared unto Moses in that burning bush. This is where he did it. And then think too in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6. Where was it where the Lord told Moses to strike the rock and water would flow forth. So even when he says here, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord, this is representative too of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back in Exodus chapter 17. And this in itself makes a good study. The different times that Horeb is mentioned in Scripture. It was where God first revealed himself in that burning bush it was where, when the Lord brought the children of Israel out before from the land of Egypt, Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. What is that picture of smiting the rock? That's Christ was smitten. And from his ribbon side came water and blood, which represents the salvation of his people. Now we know that later Moses became angry. The Lord said, speak to the rock. Because the rock can only be smitten one time. But Moses in his anger smote it again. And that's why the Lord said he would not be able to take the children of Israel into the promised land. A lot of people think that the promised land represents heaven. Well, we're in trouble if it does, because that means then that Moses wouldn't be in heaven. Although we know that when he appeared on the mount of transfiguration with Elijah, Elijah and Moses, that he appeared in glory, speaking of the death that Christ had accomplished there in the Gospel of Luke. But it does represent rest on this earth. Know that hymn people sing, I stand on Jordan's stormy banks and cast a wishful eye. To what? If Canaan is a picture of heaven, then we're in trouble because there was nothing but warfare there. But what it represents is the rest that God gives his people in the midst of warfare. That represents our life right here. If the Lord has been pleased to accomplish our salvation, he's brought us into that place, that promised place in Christ of rest. And he is our protection. So all the way through scripture we find different representations of Horeb. It's mentioned several times in the account of the wanderings of the children of Israel in the wilderness. If you cite a few of these just to say that this would make a good study. Just look up Horeb in your concordance and read the scriptures surrounding. There's a, a lesson each one. But here in Deuteronomy chapter 1, chapter 1 and verse 2, the wanderings of the children of Israel, it was around this Mount Horeb. And it represents God's law and justice. That's where God gave Moses the law. says here that these be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan in the wilderness in the plain over against the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Azeroth and Dizahab. There are 11 days journey from Horeb 
by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea, right up to the frontier of the Promised Land. Eleven days. You say, well, why did it take 40 years? Because of unbelief. Only Joshua and Caleb were the ones that were given faith and trust God, but they still wandered for 40 years with that generation. It's a representation of many who profess to be the Lord's and were surrounded by them, and yet they're left to themselves in darkness and blindness. And yet here we are, like Joshua and Caleb, in the midst of such, and it causes you to wonder, why do I see so clearly God's promises fulfilled in Christ, but others don't? How many read this same scripture and yet do so in blindness, a veil still over their face? Well, it's only in Christ that that veil's removed. So we certainly don't have any reason to boast, but it was here that God gave the Ten Commandments. And yet while Moses was up on the mountain, there was Aaron leading the people into idolatry, making the golden calf. And that golden calf would be part of the history of Israel even after Aaron. Because it was that calf worship that the servant of Solomon after his death, when he was raised up, he took ten tribes away with him. They reestablished the worship of the golden calf until hundreds of years later, God completely wiped out those ten tribes. There's a lot here. What's interesting is when you get to the New Testament, there are no more references to Horeb. The only reference close to it is in Galatians chapter 4. If you go over there, Galatians chapter 4. So it was a it was a type and picture of God's justice, but it had to go away because there's no salvation in that. In fact, as the children of Israel camped around Mount Horeb, and Moses came down off the mountain, and his face was aglow after having met with the Lord. They begged him to cover his face, and even to the point, you can read it there in Hebrews 12, where they begged God not to speak anymore. Because God said, so much as a beast touched that mountain, but God's presence was there, that the beast would be thrust through and die. People don't have an, a concept, even the beginning, of God's holiness and justice. They have a view of a loving God who would never hurt a flea. If you'll just seek him, he, he's ready and willing to take you. They, unless that justice and that holiness is satisfied, there is no salvation. And that's how it's represented here to these Galatians who after Paul, you can see it in verse 19 of Galatians 4, had gone through and preached. Galatia is an entire region. It's what we know as Asia Minor today, or Turkey, where Turkey exists uh, today. But he reminds them in verse 19, because there were these Judaizers, these law mongers, works mongers, coming back behind him and trying to turn away those that the Lord had turned to Christ by his grace. And he said, my little children, verse 19, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. It's one thing for one to say they're looking to Christ alone for salvation, but now they begin to look away, look back to the works of the flesh. It's like I heard one preacher say, you've got to have a balance between Mount Calvary and Mount Sinai. And so he said, I try to preach both. That's not what the scripture says. If Mount Sinai has not been accomplished in the death of Christ on Mount Calvary, then there's no way that Mount Sinai can help you. And this was where Paul said, I stand in doubt of you. Become enthralled again with Mount Oreb, Mount Sinai, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Someone says to me, and I've had them say it, we need to hear a little more law preaching. I've actually had someone leave here that said, you don't preach enough standards. Well, there's only one standard that we have to preach, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And his finished work at Calvary, nothing else will help. He says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one of a bond, 
made and the other of a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. So one was Hagar, the other was Sarah. Two different descendants of Abraham. But he says, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. People try to criticize me and say, you're spiritualizing the scripture. Well, talk to Paul. Because this is how we read the scriptures. He said, the one from the Mount Sinai. Now, he's talking about Horeb, but here it's called Sinai. And Sinai represents a desert place. And it says, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. So anybody that wants to go back there at Mount Horeb, other than perhaps on a tour to go see where all this took place, which I've never desired to do, but there's plenty of pictures you can look at that are available. But as far as in Scripture, why would you ever want to go back there? What took place around that mountain was nothing but death and judgment. It says for this, Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Saudi Arabia, what we know as Saudi Arabia, you go look it up on the map. And answer it to Jerusalem, which now is. You talk about giving a gut punch here to the Jews, saying this Jerusalem, with all of its rituals, and ceremonies, and everything that was still going on, even though Christ had come and fulfilled the law, but in their rebellion, they continued to persist in those traditions. He's telling them, that's no different than what took place back there at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. And brought nothing but death and condemnation, which now is and is in bondage with her children. Anybody today that looks to the flesh or the law in any fashion or manner is under bondage, is under condemnation. He says, but Jerusalem, which is above. So the purpose of that Mount Calvary, Mount Zion, there's the difference. You don't want to be back there on Sinai. You don't want to camp there. There's nothing but judgment. But Mount Zion, the Jerusalem, but which is above, it says, is what? Free. Free grace, free salvation. Why? Because Christ fulfilled the law. It says, which is the mother of us all. The mother of all of us who are, represents the, the true seed of, of Abraham. Christ. And uh, so you can see this comparison that it never, the New Testament never uses the word or. That's past. It brought nothing but condemnation. It's referred to as Mount Sinai. That's where God gave his law. But again, there's no salvation there. A lot of lessons to learn. I come back here to my text in 1 Kings 19. When, in verse 11, the Lord said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. I think what we just read in Exodus 33. He passed by. He's in this, this cave, but now he comes out and stands on this mount. And the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains. Everything you see here represents the power of God. Could God not in a breath wipe out an entire generation? Absolutely. He's God. Here it says, he rent the mountains, and it says, break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. You can imagine Elijah standing here as God's representative and God causing his power to be manifest unto Elijah. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth, the very power of God was with him and around him. The waves of the sea would, would mount up and he'd speak peace and the, the uh, waves would still. This is showing the power of the Lord even through Elijah. But the Lord was not in the wind. When it says not in the wind, doesn't mean that this was happening outside of 
the Lord ordained it, but what God purposed to do to speak to Elijah was not in that wind, and after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, what? A still, small voice. Isaiah wrote about the Lord Jesus Christ, if you want to look with me over there in Isaiah chapter 42. Notice how it speaks even of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord says, Behold my servant. You're speaking of Christ. God's servant. For what? For the salvation of his people, whom I uphold mine elect. People talk about their being elect in Christ from the foundation of the world. That's true, but there was a first elect, which was Christ himself from all eternity. Otherwise, there would be no other elect. But he says, in whom my soul delighteth. Think of Elijah here. In all this picture of his affliction and suffering and everything he endured is the type and picture of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, God's favor was ever upon Elijah. He said, I put my spirit upon him and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. There was a reason that God was preserving Elijah, even in the face of all this opposition, he was to be God's prophet to that people for that time and that day. But here's the part I wanted to see. Did Elijah have powers to stop the rain? Yeah, that's evident. He did. The Lord gave that to him. Did our Lord not have the power to destroy a whole world? In fact, there are some what they call apocryphal books, if you go back and read them. That's why as the early church read through some of these writings, they rejected them as not being inspired. That's why they call it apocryphal. They're false writings. But in them, you had the Lord Jesus Christ, even as a child, growing up and exercising certain powers to wow the people. And even in certain occasions, calling down fire from heaven. Well, that's the very thing the Lord said not to do. When the disciples were troubled by the Samaritans, they said, you want us to cry out and have fire cast down from heaven? The Lord said, you don't know what spirit you're of. When our Lord came and did his work, it, it was that still, small voice. This is how the Father communicated with his Son. There's only twice, I think maybe three times, that it said that there was a voice from heaven that said of the Son, this is my beloved Son, in whom I well please hear you hear me. Other than that, the Lord was speaking, even as here, that still small voice, speaking through his Son, even as he spoke to Elijah the prophet. He says, he shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. That still small voice, a bruised reed shall he not break, the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth, and he shall not fail nor be discouraged. So he have set judgment on the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. That's talking about him coming and fulfilling all things concerning the law of God's glory. But that's where we see coming back here to 1 Kings 19 and verse 12, that still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? Again, it was for our sake that that question was that. We know he was there at this time in that place according to God's purpose. He didn't just wander off into this cave. This was... Just like for Moses, it was a place where God would reveal his glory unto him. And he said, I have been very jealous of for the Lord God of hosts. See the repetition there, just like in verse 10? Because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant. Why is Christ on this earth? Because there's not a righteous one among us. So if the question is asked, it's not because God didn't know. What doest thou here, Elijah? This is our, for our sake and our Lord. What? What doest thou here, Son of God? What doest thou here, 
the God man? Well, it's because there's none righteous, no, not one. Apart from him being there, there would be no salvation. That's why God raised up Elijah to be that prophet to that generation through whom deliverance would be brought as a type of Christ. Of all others, as it says there, and whenever scripture says something one time, it's important, it's vital. But when it says it twice in the same chapter, that ought to get our attention. There's the behold. And he says, I, even I only am left that they seek my life to take it away. That can be said of the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone represented God in the flesh. The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and thou comest anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Did not the Lord say that the Father had given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him? This Hazel to be king over Syria that's the place where Abraham was first called out. Does God's jurisdiction go beyond the boundaries of Israel? Absolutely. He's a sovereign God. He can save whom he will, condemn whom he will. And he's going to become a key player in God's judgments. When we get into 2 Kings, you'll see that. And then Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. Wait a minute. Wasn't Ahab still the king? That's how the chapter started in verse 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. I guess the Lord was going to bring an end to Ahab's rule. Who is it that raises up and puts down but God himself? Even Elijah here being that representative of God. And then it says, And Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Meoloth, Shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room? That's an amazing thing when you stop and think here. Now Elijah's saying that there would be a time when he would be removed and another take his place. That's the way the prophets were in the Old Testament, all the way until Christ should come. After that, there's no more prophets because Christ is that prophet. No more kings, Christ is that king. No more priests because Christ is the fulfillment of all. And here he says, Thou shalt anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Ahazel shall Jehu slay. So the Lord is going to use these two for his judgments, not for salvation. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. The one who would take your place. Yet, here's the promise, yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. That's that remnant according to the election of grace. So in judgment, there's still mercy. I'm thankful it's that way, but that mercy and grace is in Christ alone. A lot there. I feel like we just skimmed the surface, but if you have the word, go back and read it. And as the Lord continues to teach us, Pray that our eyes would be open more and more to the glory of Christ through all of these types of pictures we're looking at. Let's take our hymn book and turn to hymn number 258, and then we'll be dismissed. 258. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, he taketh my birth.
burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand when clothed in his brightness transported i rise to meet him in clouds of the sky his perfect salvation is wonderful love. I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand amen all right have a good evening we'll look forward to next time